In this video I want to run through the timeline of the full Division story, up until the point that the Black Tusk launched their full invasion of the US capital. I have noted some confusion in regards to the story, so I'm going to use this opportunity to round up the story as sort of a recap piece, but also to show how the Division 1, set in New York City, crosses over with the Division 2, Washington DC. November 2015, Black Friday. A man-made virus, later called the dollar flu, is released onto the unsuspecting American public during one of retail's busiest days of the year. Based on the original smallpox virus, it was coated onto banknotes by its creator, Dr. Gordon Amherst, and distributed in Abel's department store, where it quickly spread from person to person through the exchange of money. While the virus was still in its incubation period, it continued to quickly infect shoppers and tourists across New York City, before the first symptoms of the virus could be seen. December 1st, symptoms of the dollar flu begin to emerge. Medical facilities are quickly overwhelmed by the number of cases. The federal government's disease control division and other federal authorities stepped in and quickly declared a state of emergency. Unfortunately, it was too late. The virus had spread too fast, and the option of containment seemed impossible. The National Guard was called in, and the whole of New York City was put on lockdown. Roads in and out of the city are blocked off, public transport is suspended, businesses are closed, and people are ordered to stay in their homes. New York City has become like a ghost town. December 6th, President Lawrence Waller orders a lockdown of New York City. The US military was called in to seal off any means of exiting the city. Sarah begins mass vaccinations, focusing on the first responders and health workers, before moving on to the public via clinics, workspaces, and large parking lots. This created a feeling of relief in the city. Stores begin to reopen, and people were allowed back onto the streets, under a curfew. Throughout the city, Sarah set up field clinics and distributed supplies and medications. Sarah also set up a mass treatment facility for advanced smallpox cases, which was located in a sealed off section in the middle of Manhattan. Medical personnel started to round up infected citizens, and bus them to the treatment facility. Construction of a reinforced perimeter wall also began. Days later, the feeling of relief turns to horror as medical staff find the existing smallpox vaccine has no effect on this new strain of the virus. On top of this, the relaxed attitude towards public activity and curfews allowed the disease to spread further and faster than before. Shortly after, the first wave of deaths sweep across the city. December 11th. The World Health Organization officially declared the outbreak a pandemic. The president invoked martial law nationwide. In New York, food and supplies begin to run low, meaning the black markets started popping up in large numbers, and smuggling activity increased. Fear and anarchy starts to spread, and looters readily break curfews and begin threatening local hospitals and businesses. Many people try and leave the city. Unfortunately, with the government troops enforcing the quarantine lines, escape was now impossible. Heavily outnumbered, security teams begin to withdraw from some of the more dangerous neighborhoods due to the increasing violence and mob activity. Around this time, the decision was made for the police and military to join together and form the Joint Task Force. Meanwhile, the global pandemic had reached Washington DC. Residents, aware of what was happening in New York, panic and mass civil anarchy spreads across the city. Due to this, public services break down within 72 hours. December 15th. In an attempt to control the spread of the disease, authorities designated new containment areas in Manhattan and makeshift barriers were erected by local engineers. Treatment facilities located in the center of Manhattan had become more and more dangerous. Mob activity was at an all-time high, violent escape attempts regularly occurred, and barbaric activity in the city was only getting worse. As the JTF continued to suffer heavy losses, they had no alternative but to leave large sections of the city unpatrolled. In Washington DC, the US Capitol Police and Metro Police locked down the entire district of Columbia and National Guard units are summoned to provide extra protection for federal workers and government officials. December 18th. In the face of the growing crisis, President Waller invoked the National Security Presidential Directive 51, activating the first wave of Strategic Homeland Division agents into New York City. The President, along with his family and senior staff, were evacuated from the White House. 
Two days later, the sealed off Manhattan treatment facility fell due to the overwhelming stress and panic from those being held within. The area became a death trap, filled with infected corpses, fires and hostile gangs. From here it gained a new name, the Dark Zone. Within 24 hours, the JTF and medical personnel were forced to abandon the area. They fell back to the James Farley post office and set up a new base of operations for both Sarah and the JTF. Late December, reports from the first wave of division agents describe unimaginable levels of chaos, though they continue to fight through the growing violence in an attempt to restore order to the city. But over the next few days, contact with the entire division team is lost. Reports are now coming in of up to 200,000 casualties due to the virus and the growing violence within the city, and many more are missing. New York City is on the brink of collapse. On top of this, a breakout from Rikers Island has occurred. Thousands of violent and desperate criminals have escaped and are now running loose on the mainland. Many of them band together to form a powerful new gang called the Rikers and begin carving out large portions of the city as their territory. January 1st, 2016. Division agents from the District of Columbia in Washington DC were activated by the President. Food and gas shortages combined with widespread power outages has created citywide rioting and looting. High-level government officials were relocated to secure sites around the country. Just like in New York, military and police agencies in Washington DC are combined into a single unit called the Joint Task Force. Treatment facilities are established by Sarah inside the Smithsonian Castle in the National Mall and on Roosevelt Island. January 6th. After the disappearance of the first wave, the President activates the second wave of division agents in New York City. After suffering heavy losses on their way into the area, the second wave begins clearing the hostile presence with the JTF. January 7th. President Waller dies from cardiac arrest. Rumours start, stating that he died from the dollar flu, in turn creating a new wave of panic. Vice President Thomas Mendes is sworn in as President. January 10th. The Joint Task Force promotes the head of the Maryland National Guard, Colonel Anton Ridgway, to JTF Field Commander, with the new rank of General. Ridgway begins a merciless crackdown on mob violence in the capital. Late January. The city's infrastructure continues to fall. Even with the National Guard camps being set up across DC, order is becoming increasingly difficult to maintain, as gang fighting spreads across the northern neighborhoods. Early February. The situation continues to get worse in Washington DC. The broken chain of command in the US military causes troops to be thrown into crisis. There are desertions, widespread deaths, and the uprisings of the hostile factions are starting to get out of control. February 14th. The gang fighting in the northern parts of DC stop due to several of the major criminal gangs calling a truce and forming a council. This group would be known as the Hyenas and with their new combined force are now able to spread the violence faster and further throughout the city. Late February. General Ridgway's increasingly lethal measures in pursuit of re-establishing control over the city eventually leads to his arrest, a court-martial and imprisonment. Loyal members of his JTF unit break him out, and under Ridgway's leadership, this new force, who would now be known as the True Sons, made it their goal to establish territory and dominate the populace. Early March. Spring brings some ease to the situation, but in Washington DC, the JTF have collapsed, and the gangs now have nothing to stop them from taking complete control of the city. On top of this, survivors of the forced quarantine on Roosevelt Island that were originally under Ridgway's control have overthrown the camp after being mistreated for too long. Out for revenge on the JTF and the general public that allowed it to happen, these survivors formed a new faction calling themselves the Outcasts. A Sarah refugee camp established at George Washington University begins to achieve self-sustainability and defense. This camp grows into a community settlement that will be known as the Campus. In the East, General Ridgway and the True Sons gain control over the US Capitol building and establish their headquarters. Late March, civilians desperate to escape the gang fighting in the northeast of DC start to assemble in Ford's Theatre. Led by former division agent Odessa Sawyer after the death of the settlement's previous leader, 
the residents fortify the structure and build a self-sufficient settlement called the Theatre. April 9th. Just three months after being sworn in, President Mendez dies from an apparent suicide. But circumstances around his death indicate that the Secret Service may be compromised. Hidden away in an undisclosed location with other members of Congress, Speaker of the House Andrew Ellis is sworn in as the new president. Early May, Air Force One is fired upon whilst returning to Washington DC. Crash landing near the capital, President Ellis survives but is captured by the hyenas. The SHD network is mysteriously taken down. Cut off from each other, the division agents follow through with their operational guidelines which lead them back to the nation's capital. Over the following days, agents arrive from various parts across the US to find the White House under siege by the various hostile factions that are running the city. Late May, Washington DC has been reduced to three remaining settlements, the castle, the campus, and the theater, and they are under constant threat by the hostile factions. The division's main base of operations, the White House, is still under pressure too, so agency forces are spread thin across the city while attempting to defend the few remaining settlements and expanding the network of safe areas. Early June, the True Sons launch a chemical assault on the settlement in the old Smithsonian Castle. Most residents die immediately from the attack. With the area now being contaminated, the settlement would become a no-man's land. Late June, the division managed to rescue President Ellis from the hyenas and a new secret organization called the Black Tusk is revealed to have been responsible for the SHD network being taken down. July Division agents recovered President Ellis's briefcase from the True Sons at the Capitol building. With this, the President is able to access the location of the Broad Spectrum Antiviral, the cure for the dollar flu. But as the city starts to celebrate the series of small wins, President Ellis disappears without a trace at the exact moment that the Black Tusk launch a full invasion into Washington DC. And now we're up to the present game time, where the Division was able to stop the antivirals from being extracted from the capital, and President Ellis is discovered to be a traitor, with his location still unknown. Hopefully that cleared a few things up, but there's still one thing that doesn't quite make sense. And this was brought to my attention in the comments section of one of my previous videos, and on my Discord by the keen-eyed user, Navina. In New York, the second wave of division agents were activated, and part of their objective was to find out what happened to the first wave. Over time, it was found that a number of them went rogue under Aaron Keener's leadership. But from a recording in DC, we found that this wasn't the case. It's clear that a small-scale activation didn't do the trick. Hell, it went backwards on us. We've got reports of agents going rogue. With all due respect, Mr. President, you can't toe dip in a situation like this. Half measures aren't worth squat. Half measures my ass. Those agents have full executive authority and the most advanced tech in our arsenal. None of that matters if you took them into the deep end without a lifeline. Jesus, Larry. You've read history books. Fine. Call Louis Chang and let him know the second wave is a go. President Wall was made aware of the first wave going rogue long before activating the second wave. Why wasn't this passed on to the SHD in New York? I've been speculating over this for a long time and even my tinfoil hat theories don't really make sense. I refuse to believe that this is simply an overlooked detail in the continuation of the Division story, so what do you think happened here? Let me know in the comments, or on my Discord, or even on the Twitterverse. I have all the links in the description. Otherwise, thank you very much for watching, and I'll catch you in the next one. Cheers!